So as a computer security officer, I have just one plea, and this will be the next 15 minutes uh, to everybody who is doing touching keyboards, doing development, uh, setting up services. And um, since I'm a lazy guy, I'm giving you the presentation to avoid that I have to do work. I would like to you doing more work and uh, help us securing every software stack which we're producing. So this is about the use, your use of tools, training for more secure software. Why I'm talking this? Because the problem is more or less sitting in this, this, this auditorium. We are the problem. We are producing code like the code here, which has been used since 2004 in one of our interactive Linux clusters, which means this is used by, the Linux cluster is used by 10,000 of people every day. And 10,000 of those people can more or less submit to the function here their own files. And if they do, since this is both user control, they can introduce some shell commands, they can put some symbolic links, which means that using this routine will enable everybody who's spotting this to take over the whole computing cluster. And we're running this since 2004. Why is this happening? Because due diligence at the time of programming wasn't there. Nobody was checking whether the code makes sense. Code software security is very, very important, at least for me, because I'm just working too much correcting the, the mistakes of the past. If you look at CERN, CERN is target. We got people outside CERN who tried to attack us and get into our systems. There are people who are browsing. CERN is disclosing passwords, um, source code, and tickets. Some of the things are true, some others not. For example, most of our code is public because we have this on, on GitLab or GitHub. That's on purpose, but other things are not. I didn't get access to your databases, but hacked a website with a cross-site scripting attack. Would you like to know if you're the right person to talk about this and try to make a deal to give you all information? There are people blackmailing us because they made it into our computing systems. They made it into our web servers. Hacking the Large Hadron Collider, part number one. Part number two, there are videos on the internet where you can see how they exploited a cross-site scripting vulnerability or some authorization bypass. They didn't get close to the LHC, but this is what they thought. And last but not least, using this exploit, some software to take over servers, against CERN would be a win to hack the people who created the Internet. There are people who are trying to get into CERN, misusing systems, services, which are set up by CERN developers. Maybe by you, maybe by others. We get problems like cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting means more or less you can inject into an input field like this one where you're supposed to type in my name to get my telephone number. But if you type in some code, like uh, alert, script, alert, end of script, this is executed by the browser. Here, it is not doing any harm, but of course, if you change the code, you can start doing harm to the end users. Unfortunately, the new version of the phone book we had had the same problem. You can inject some uh, HTML code here, italic and underscore, and it's di directly making it to the web page. You can go worse. Directory transversal. Input has not been checked, so if you put lots of double dots here, you go up the hierarchy on your hard disk, and then you enter in the ETC folder, and you get the full list of the password W file, a WD file. Worse, here it's just a listing, but if you can inject commands like cat slash ETC password, you get the result, or if you in inject something like uname-a, you get the operating system. And the worst case, and this happened in 2000 and, uh, and nine, somebody was able to take over a server and establish a nice terminal at home. This is what his terminal was looking like, and he had direct access to our web server because, again, he was able to inject some code. This is the server takeover. At CERN, we're trying to control this. We've got a security team which is helping developers, and I will explain to you later how we try to, to help developers. But thinking of you, you are the generation who is not dealing with servers anymore. You might be the generation who is dealing with this. I just took the pictures last weekend. This is my Sony television. This is my Apple TV box here. You can't see it. It's here. It's black. I bought the black one. I think there's only black one. Got my Wii U here. I got my Yamaha sound system here. This is my power, solar power converter, which is connected to the internet or to the intranet. This is my Sony hi-fi stereo. And this is not my car. I don't like Nissan, but this is the, the car of a colleague in Nissan Leaf. All of those systems are highly interconnected nowadays. I can use my telephone to send music here. I can send my films to Apple TV. I can browse the internet with Sony TV. Of course, I can play uh, Super Mario Kart 8 with other peers around the world. Um, this one is just uh, giving me some information how much energy I made per day or per night. And, uh, of course, listening to music here, airplay, and here, get my status of my co code. This is the Internet of Things. This is software. 
And this is software, like the control systems for actuators, which can hardly be corrected for once it's deployed. And this is where the next fuck-up will come. And the next fuck-up happened already in October last year, where the Mirai botnet was DDoSing the world using the Internet of Things devices, routers and other things which were just vulnerable because the software which has been written was not sufficiently secured, not sufficiently tested. The software is coming in beta, and it's up to me, it's up to us as end users to bear the cost. It's up to us to bear the cost for fixing this. It's up to us for paying patching cycles and whatever else. And this is where the rescue comes in. The rescue is developers reviewing how development is done. You might have seen this one. Fixing a bug in the development cycle early has no cost. Fixing the bug once the system is in service has a tremendous cost. The difference is who is bearing the cost. Here the cost is borne by you because you have to invest more time. Here the costs are not necessarily borne by you but by me because me, my organization, now has to invest in antivirus software. We have to invest in monitoring intrusion detection system. We have to do active scanning. We have to patch and patch again. And once we've patched, we patch again again. And we patch a third time. Every month we patch the Windows computers because software development lifecycle in Microsoft is not the perfect one. I'm not talking about Androids because in Androids you are bearing the costs. Androids nowadays are vulnerable and you will never get it fixed because your software vendor or your hardware vendor doesn't even care. To make it more easy for you, XKCD, what are you working on? Trying to fix the problem. I created when I tried to fix a problem, when I tried to fix a problem, when I tried to fix a problem. And now the question is, do you want to invest in fixing the problems beforehand or shall I invest to fix the problem in the aftermath? So what are we doing are very simple things. I will not go in, 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 in rocket science here. There are tools around which you can run on top of your code for identifying standard design flaws, mistakes, usages of routines for C, C++, CCP Lint, Floor Finder, Reds, Cavity, VCG. There are tools for Java. There are tools for Perl, whoever use Perl, PHP, uh, Python, and PHP. Those are tools which you can use freely. You just download them, and once you compile, you just run it in front of your, your compiler. Or if, you're even, if you have a software development lifecycle, you integrate this into GitLab Common Interface, for example. This is what we are doing. We're providing Docker images for the developer community, which they can run on top of the code before the code is finalized and getting production. You run this, and you get some outcome. And this is not only for the security. This will also increase the availability of your code. Not having memory leaks anymore, and your code is, is, is stopping every 30 days, every year, every 10 years. This is also making your code better, running those tools. And those tools come for free. If you do not like this, you can even go into the cloud. There's a web page called Swamp. The link is here, where you can submit your code. You can define on which platform you'd like to compile this. And then before compilation, this software, this cloud service, is checking your code for vulnerabilities. Be aware. With this, you give your code to somebody else. So if you get something secret in your code, maybe this is not the most optimal way. There might be better ones, like uh, downloading those tools which you got here. There are also commercial tools. I just listed here mostly, apart from Coverty, I listed only public tools. If you're developing web pages, we at CERN, we are giving the possibility to web designers to test their code for vulnerabilities. Apex, Oracle Application Builder, there are tools where you can run a vulnerability scanner. If you set up a web page at CERN, here's a web page which is called APEG. You see how you can manage the web page, and you can ask for security scan. And then the security team will do a scan and look whether your website is susceptible for cross-site scripting, SQL injection, having some common flaws which are exploited by the attackers once your web page is getting online. And you can run those tools yourself. This is based on OpenWAS, which is a spin-off of a tool called Nessus. It's freely available. You just can download this and use this on top of your code. If you go on the web, there's the Open Web Application Security Project, which is listing the 10 mostly exploited vulnerabilities for web pages. And if you're doing web, de web deployment, if you're doing web development, go on this web page, try to understand what those vulnerabilities are and whether your code can be exploited by one of those means. OpenVAS is testing for this. But maybe we can even go one step further. What about training? 
We're giving training courses for secure programming in Python, in Java, developing secure software. Because what we learned is most of the students coming from university have learned how to set up a web server, how to run a database, how to program, how to design software. But it's very rare that also setting up a secure web server, securing databases, or developing secure software is not in their mandate. This is not what they've learned. So this is the chance to give people additional expertise how to program in a secure fashion such that the code cannot be misused. For those ones who are got some leaking blood here and getting interest, we're even going one step further. So far, up to last week, we've trained 150 people becoming something we call white hats. People who we gave the chance to learn penetration testing capabilities. Penetration testing means how do you attack a web page to find the flaws and to break into the web page. It's based on something which is called a capture the flag portal. You got different exercises, and here are the exercises. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here you get all the names. And what you're doing is you're starting on a fake web page with lots and lots of vulnerabilities, and you try to figure out who's running the web page, try to get ownership of the web page, alter information on the web page, exploit vulnerabilities. This is a training which we're giving so the people are learning how the other side, how the attackers are misusing your services. Why that? If you program, you usually think of use cases. I'm not. I'm not looking at use cases. I'm not looking at the name field on the phone book. I'm looking for abuse cases. How can I misuse your software? How can I misuse a web page? How can I misuse a database such that I can enter in the database into the web server using the software that I get ownership of the underlying server? Because this is what I'm looking for. I would like to own the server. If I own the server, I own the life of CERN. If I own your computer, I own your life. I own your web camera, I own your keyboard, I own your music files, I own your software, I own your pictures and your access to Facebook. This is what I'm interested in, abusing the software. And this is why we need you to help us to avoid that. Training, if you want to train yourself, hack yourself, get on those web pages, hack this site, the damned vulnerable web application, there's Google Gruyere project, OWASP again is providing you hacking portals. You can go on those websites. You might subscribe, but then you get a plethora of lots and lots of web pages which are all vulnerable. And for you, it's the joy to break into those websites and figure out whether they can be broken. And once you've learned how to do this, apply it to your software, apply it to your web page, and see whether you can break into your own website. This is what we're doing at CERN, giving people the chance to break into their services. So here are my plea to you when you're starting programming as of uh, tonight. The first thing, and this is more or, less, more or less helping me in 80% of my cases, is check your input. Whenever you have an input field, which is public, check the input, make sure if you're expecting a number, you get a number, and not something which is looking like code. If you're expecting a name, there shouldn't be an ampersand, or there shouldn't be a, a bigger sign or a smaller sign. Those are things which must be filtered away. In some software packages, this comes for free. There are routines for this, for filtering this away. It just must be done. With this, no SQL injection. With this, no cross-site scripting, no cross-site request forgery. I'm already prevented. No command line injection. Very easy, but you must find the time to apply those routines to your code on each user-facing input field. Protect secrets. Sometimes you have to exchange secrets if you connect for a database, for example, or if you connect between client and server. Make sure that those secrets cannot be taken over by somebody else. This sounds very, very simple, but there are still too many services out there, in particular if you look at Internet of Things devices, which are using HTTP and believing HTTP is a very good protocol to ship a password from the client to the server side. But HTTP is not encrypted, which means that even in this room, wireless access points are sitting over there, and over there, and I can now enter my computer in a permissions mode, and I can look who is browsing at this very moment web pages in clear text. Maybe I can look at your cookie. And once I get your cookie, in HTTP, I can over take over your session. If I have your password, I can take over your session too. So protect the secrets, and there are means for protecting the secrets. And please don't reinvent the wheel. If you have no expertise in setting up a web server or a database, maybe you ask somebody, maybe you get a book. I see too often at CERN that people think they cannot set up a web server. Some summer students coming in, setting up a web server for somebody. A nice web server here. Fully functional, using Internet 4.5.0 technologies. Brilliant. 
completely insecure and the summer student will be gone and I'm sitting there on a web server which is completely insecure because the student has no clue how to set this up in the proper fashion. So again here, get a book, get some training, ask an expert. Or maybe you're not in the right job and you should switch jobs. At CERN we get an IT department, so I ask the IT department guys. Sometimes they know what they are doing. Look on our web page. We get tests. We get good programming guidelines for C, C++, Java, Perl, Python, PHP. Here we are again with the secrets, recall. Here are the secrets. We get a security checklist, which you can go through your code. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And then here are the static code analyzer tool, also for Apex, for web applications, and some bibliography. Think of your development lifecycle. If you're doing proper development, you're using tools like Jenkins, GitLab, continuous integration, other tools for your deployment process. And those deployment processes usually allow you to plug in any other checker. So take security code analyzers, static code analyzers tools into your checking. It's not only about compiling, it's about compiling and checking. If you check at your compiler, minus W all is your friend. Maybe it's dumping you with lots and lots of messages which you don't like, but those messages have a being. So maybe getting rid of the messages is a good idea instead of just not using this, 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 um, this flag and ignoring everything else. And then I mentioned OWASP and the academic, where you can go and, um, and learn yourself. Last but not least, at least if you're working for CERN, computer.security.cern.ch, we can help you. We can make code assessment reviews and helping you to get, a, to get your code in a secure fashion. I still have a few minutes, so let's use this few minutes to figure out in this 20 lines of code, where we can ignore the first four, are many, many different vulnerabilities. Somebody got an idea? I leave this for you as an exercise. You can find the slides on our security web pages, maybe attached to, this, uh, to the agenda of this, uh, to this event. Here's the solution. Thank you very much.